In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Oh, 
who declarest thine almighty power, chiefly in showing mercy and pity, mercifully grant unto us such a measure of thy grace, that we, running the way of thy commandments, may obtain thy gracious promises and be made partakers of thy heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. The Old Testament lesson appointed for reading on this, the 10th Sunday following Trinity, is recorded for us in the prophecy given through St. Jeremiah, chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words, saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Here ends the Old Testament lesson. We read responsively Psalm 143 as printed in the bulletin. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. Do not enter into judgment with your servant. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. I remember the days of old and meditate on all your works. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty man. Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be Cause me to bear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I shall walk, for I have given my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. For the Spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your In your mercy, cut off my enemies. And destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Holy Epistle appointed for this day is recorded for us in St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. 
For to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually as he wills. Here ends the Holy Epistle. Keep me, O Lord, as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Let my sentence come forth from thy presence. Let the eyes behold the things that are equal. Hallelujah, hallelujah. O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Hallelujah. Arise for the reading of the Holy Gospel recorded for us in the Gospel according to St. Luke, beginning in chapter 19 at the 41st verse. As Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests, the scribes and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Here ends the Holy Gospel.
Please arise as I read once again the Holy Gospel, which serves as the basis of our meditation this morning. St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 41 through 48. As Jesus drew near to the city, he saw it and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything. For all the people were very attentive to hear him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, make us holy in the truth. Your word is true. Amen. Please be seated. Dear fellow redeemed by the blood of the spotless Lamb of God, whose blood makes possible our repentance and salvation. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What do you think of the name of our congregation? You know, there's some history there, isn't there? Those from Old Grace uh, still have a bit of a bone in the craw, and that's completely understandable. Um, Grace was a perfectly fine name for a church, and why change it, and of all things, to Reformation? Others may think of the name Reformation as, yes, Reformation, that time when Luther stood up to the bureaucracy and was victorious. Ah, that kind of misses the point, too, doesn't it, really? Reformation is really actually a very humble sort of idea. The idea that God's church, his bride, needs to repent of her sins, to humble herself, to clean up her act, wash her clothes, sweep out the house, set things in order, not just once, but day after day after day. All through the history of God's people, all through our history, there have been many, many Reformation moments. Our altarpiece pictures three of those moments, and if you've heard me talk about this before, you read this particular painting, and that's what we do in the church. We read the artwork. It is made in a language to communicate truths about God's word. So this painting is read like Hebrew from the law side of the altar to the gospel side of the altar, from your right to your left, or as Jesus would be facing you, it would be his left and his right. I'm sorry, your right and, and left. Jesus left and his right. And if you think about Jesus separating the sheep and the goats, the goats on his left hand want to do things by the law, by what they do. They will earn salvation. Lord, when did we ever see you in need and not do this? Well, Jesus responds, by the standard that they chose, any time you failed to do it for me, you did not do it. So go away. By contrast, those on his right, his sheep, are welcomed into his presence because they can't imagine that they ever did anything good for Jesus. They were so focused on what Jesus did for them. So as you read our painting, it starts in the Old Testament with Moses and the bronze serpent. And if you remember what happened there, the people grumbled against God. They sinned. They needed to clean up their act. And God sent poisonous serpents among them, and the people started to die, and they cried out. And God told Moses to make a seraphim and put it on a pole. So he fashioned this fiery serpent. Or is it an angel? And put it on a stake and told him to tell the people that if anyone is bit by one of these poisonous stakes, if they will look to that image, trusting in God's promise, they would not die. Notice what God did not do. He did not take the poisonous snakes away. But he provided a way out. He provided salvation. But it took an act of faith. He localized that salvation in an image of what his own son would do when he came. 
And really, it was Christ himself speaking with Moses, we understand. And so Jesus was saying, this is what I'm going to look like when I came. And Jesus, in his ministry, said, just as Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man, Jesus himself, be lifted up. Whoever looks to him will not die, but have everlasting life. Centuries later, Jesus came. And... He taught the people. And so our center panel, which we focus on Christ as the center of everything, and he is pictured a bit bigger than life, if you will, amongst the people he's teaching. And represented there are people from all nations of the world, some rich, some poor, young, old, people that look like you, people who don't look like you. It's not historically accurate per se, although it's not exactly historically inaccurate because when Jesus taught his Sermon on the Mount, there were the faithful there from living all over the world. So, you know, there might have been a smattering of people who looked pretty much like the people pictured there. But that's not the point. The point is Jesus repeatedly said that he had come from all people. That was clear in the Old Testament as well, even, even with Jonah where Jonah had a Reformation moment where he couldn't imagine that God would send him to preach repentance to a foreign nation that was at the border of his own country, threatening to overthrow them. That sounds vaguely familiar to me for some reason today in our world. A foreign nation at our border threatening to overrun our country, and yet God would send his prophet to warn them that he's going to destroy them. And Jonah knew what that was all about. If God bothers to condemn someone for their sin, it means God is not yet done with them. God seeks their repentance and wants to spare them. And God says as much a couple of times over, at least in the Old Testament. So Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, called his people to a reformation, simply saying, you have heard such and such, but I tell you. And it's interesting to examine Jesus' words. He doesn't say anything new or different. He really verbatim quotes the law given through Moses. Nothing new. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I tell you not to resist the evil person. He is not saying that in the civil realm, we do not stop evil with force. You have to. And that's told us in another way by Jesus himself. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Or through Paul. The governing authorities do not bear the sword for nothing. But the point, when Jesus said, I tell you, is that you are to be merciful and loving. Don't seek revenge. Eye for an eye is not you getting revenge for what somebody did to you. But rather, the civil authorities are to mete out a punishment in keeping with the crime. That's the point. But you, in your daily life, when somebody insults you, you don't need to go and insult them back. Bear it. I'm not going to kill you. Somebody slaps you on the face, insults you. You can let it go. Isn't that what Jesus did? Didn't we human beings spit on him? Slap him and beat him? Scourge him, not merely whipping, but scourging to tear out pieces of the flesh? Beat a crown of thorns into his head mock him, spit on him, drive nails through his hands and feet to raise him up to die. And he didn't cry out, God damn them. He cried out, Father, forgive them. And how we take umbrage at the slightest offense. You have heard, Jesus said. Let me reform your way of thinking. The third panel on the gospel side, we see Luther not in the barren land of the law because the law is in a barren land, not only because historically it was out in the wilderness somewhere when the law was given, but because the law makes demands, but it does not give life. 
The law always kills. The law does not only kill, mind you, but it does always kill. It is always putting us to death one way or another. The gospel, on the other hand, gives life. And the Reformation, the Reformation that we think of, took place, well, at least we hold the birth of it, in the fall of the year, October 31st, when Luther nailed up the 95 Theses. We look to that as sort of the beginning point. But it was in the autumn time of history, ever since Jesus ascended into heaven, we have been in that last hour, St. John wrote in his first letter, little children, it is now the last hour. We're right there. Behold, I am coming quickly, Jesus said in his revelation to St. John. Behold, I am at the door. His hand is on the door handle, ready to yank it open, and there he will be. He wept over the city of Jerusalem at the start of Holy Week when he approached it and he saw the city he cried if you if you had known you at this your time when your king is here the one you've been waiting for but now it's hidden from your eyes and you will be destroyed the immorality that was taking place in Jerusalem the cheating of people, the slandering. How are we doing according to God's commandments? We reflected on already this morning and it passed us by so quickly we probably missed it. How are we doing? We think about slandering somebody. Do we believe that if it's true, it's not slander? I was behind somebody in the grocery store the other day. They were looking at one of those magazines. I, you know, I have myself convinced nobody, nobody buys those or reads those, but apparently somebody does. He was talking about who was on the covers at Prince Henry, and, you know, and here they had a big row. Well, why would you talk about that? Why would you put that in print and put photos of that sort of thing? I mean, if it's me and I'm having trouble in my marriage, the last thing I want is everybody in the world to know about it and talk about it. I want your prayers want to work through it. Every foible that somebody does, walking down the street, driving their car, answering a question in class, broke apart at work. We want that blab to everyone. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Just because it's true. It doesn't give you license to say it. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. How loving are we? And those commandments, do we even know them? You know, we recite through them, and just like the one about not bearing false witness, unless we read the rest of the scriptures, we don't know exactly everything that encompasses. So it is with our sexual sins today. The scriptures even talk to things like transgenderism. It really, really addresses that. Condemns homosexuality tells us that no fornicator, somebody who has sex out of marriage, is going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Yet we are told that such we were. All of us. If you look at the litany of sins that is condemned in the scriptures over and over and over, none of us gets out. None of us gets a pass. Not one of us. And we are so busy pointing the finger at somebody else. I'm not like that person. I'm, I'm better than that. Jesus wept over the city. You know, you read his words. If you had known, but you're going to be thrown down. He's crying when he says it. He's not angry there. Not when he weeps over the city. When he wept over Jerusalem, he was in tears. He was profoundly sad that the chief city, the capital of his chosen people, would be utterly destroyed because of their immorality, which was probably not a gross, crass immorality, but a much more soft immorality of saying things that might be perfectly true, but not loving to repeat, of excusing people for their sexual indiscretions because, well, you know, what does it matter as consenting adults? Or, or, Finding the woman caught in adultery 
which if the woman was caught in adultery, the man must have been too pointing the finger at her. What are you going to do to her? She was caught in the very act. Right. Except that the law under Moses said that both the woman and the man were to be punished. Where's the man? Why the double standard? You see how easily we fall into things that in God's eyes are horrifically immoral. Jesus weeps. If you only understood, the day is coming and it will come like that. When we are told that the stars will fall out of the sky, the sky itself will be rolled up like you'd roll up a scroll or a sheet, and boom, you're going to be staring into heaven, and there he is. And now it's too late to do anything differently. And he went into the temple, and now he was angry. He drove out those who were buying and selling. So you're stealing from people. At that time, it seems that what was going on is the priests were making a profit selling access to forgiveness. You bring a lamb to sacrifice, that's not good enough. You've got to buy that lamb from that guy there. And by the way, I get a cut of the profits. You cannot give an offering with that stuff with Washington on it or Lincoln or whoever's on there. Ben. You've got to put this money in. So you take that money, you make an exchange there, and then you put that in and we'll take our cut of that too. In our day, the churches steal from people, I think, in another way. When they say things like, Jesus didn't condemn anyone, neither do I, neither do we. Yeah, he did. He condemned all sorts of people, repeatedly. It wasn't that he hated them, but he called them to repentance. You gotta change. You don't fit through the gate in the shape you're in. You need to let me cleanse you. Then you'll be able to fit through the door. Churches that say, well, God is love, so everybody must be saved. God says so, doesn't he? God desires that everyone be saved, therefore everybody must be saved. Isn't that true? They steal from people because they leave out the words, God does not desire the death of the wicked, but that he turn from his wicked ways and be saved or live. Repentance is what it's about. Jesus never rejects the one who is repentant, but he does say, go and sin no more. You got to stop it. You got to make the change. And in our psalm, it's pointed out that we're getting worn down. There have been various, we would say, nefarious people through history. We have pointed out that the average person cannot handle a constant attack, morally speaking, that you know, they're accused of wrongdoing or they're you know, pushed to do something immoral or whatever, that eventually they will crack. And you and I probably firmly believe that as our bodies are getting older and weaker and sicker, that somehow at the same time, Swimming around in a cesspool of immorality in our world, our spirits are getting stronger. I hope that's true. But I wouldn't be sure of that. Let him who stands take heed, lest he fall, we are told. Don't be so sure. So Jesus went into the temple because, because judgment begins with the house of God went into the temple and cleaned it up. Fine Reformation moment. Cleaned it up. Got rid of the ones who were stealing from his people. And the leaders, the ones who were profiting by it, wanted to destroy him, but they couldn't. Why? Because the faithful were hanging on every word. That's the way it is today. In the churches where the people long to hear the pure word of God, they, they can't get rid of Christ, can't get rid of his word, because the people pipe up and say, whoa, 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 wait a minute here. And in a nation that fights against Christ, where God's people exist and long to hear his word, they can try to attack Jesus. But they really can't if the masses of the people love him. 
So in our nation, where we straddle the line between the house of God and his city, the civil and the spiritual realms, we have been lulled into this falsehood of thinking that the church has nothing to say about civil government and that we dare not bring our morality into the civil realm. And because we are not actively bringing our morality into the civil realm, guess who's bringing their morality into the civil realm? You wonder why it gets worse and worse in our nation. You wonder why all of us have trouble with the very things that I pointed out today that are violations of God's law. We have trouble wrapping our minds around what really is moral and immoral because we are so influenced by everyone around us. And so until we really start to study God's word and embrace it and speak it to the people around us and try to make God's morality the law of the land, we will continue to be influenced by it to our own demise. Lot, we are told. Remember Lot? Abraham said, we're both getting too big. Our households, our family businesses are getting so huge, it's causing confusion among our workers. We've got to separate. You choose where you want to go. And he choose, chose to live among the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we are told that he tormented his own soul on a daily basis living among those people. I suppose we could all pack up and move somewhere. But the fact of the matter is, most of us didn't really choose to live in the United States. We were born here. Here we are. Even in this part of the country, for the most part, here we are. Wasn't so much our choosing. But we claim that our government is of, by, and for the people. And yet we would like to get out from under the responsibility of it. But we do have a responsibility as citizens of the United States. And to some extent, we will answer for what our country does. We don't have direct control, and that's probably good. But we can be an influence. But it begins with the house of God. It begins with you and I. It begins with us looking at our lives in light of God's holy word and understand God shows his work chiefly in showing acts of mercy. But the acts of mercy presuppose repentance that we know our sin, that we do not steal from the people around us because if we pat them on the back on the road to hell and tell them that their sin is not sin in God's eyes, then we steal from them their one chance at repentance. How can you repent of a sin that you do not believe is sin? We need to know. We need to read his word. We need to call sinners to repentance after we ourselves have truly and sincerely repented of our own sin. And then we pray for them and work for their good. And part of that is having the government speak according to the morality of God because, let's face it, even you and I, when we look at right and wrong, it all has to do with, am I going to get a fine for that or possibly go to prison or have to do community service or is it okay in the eyes of my government? That's how we understand God's law for the most part. You can distinguish between the civil kingdom and the heavenly kingdom, but you can't exactly separate them. And so Jesus weeps over the one and gets angry over the other because his church, his people, are to bring forgiveness and offer it to all people. Here in the church is the refuge, the true refuge, where we are worn down, morally speaking, by everything that goes on around us, and we can come here, and our wounds can be salved and patched up. We can be fed and encouraged to get back out there and do our part. And whatever our station in life no matter what it is, we have a part in the kingdom of heaven. We sometimes get to a point in life, sometimes earlier than later, sometimes for a period of time, where we're sort of confined to a bed or something like that. We begin to think we're, we're useless. And it's at that time when the most important thing is truly left to us. Watch and pray. 
Watch and pray. Because it's not too late. The time is still going on. Not because the prophecies have not been fulfilled. But the time goes on, as we are told. Because God is patient, not desiring that anyone should perish. And so we keep on keeping on, day by day at our daily activities, but remembering the people around us, watching and praying and calling to repentance, not in anger, but in love and tenderness, knowing that God does not desire the death of the sinner, but that the sinner repent and be saved. And there is not one of us, not one of us, who isn't exactly that, a sinner to whom Jesus calls to to repent and freely offers forgiveness. This should be a joy for us in our nation because in our nation there is nobody yet absolutely preventing us from telling others about the beautiful gifts that we have in our Savior Jesus. Oh, the persecutions are growing, to be sure. But we are still free to speak and still free to worship and pray together in peace. Thanks be to God for these blessings. Let us always joyfully undertake the responsibility as God's people on the one hand and citizens of this nation on the other. Amen. Please arise for the blessing. And now the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who art worthy to be had in reverence by all the children of men, we give thee most humble and hearty thanks for the innumerable blessings, both temporal and spiritual, which without any merit or worthiness on our part thou hast bestowed upon us. We praise thee, especially that thou hast preserved unto us in their purity thy saving word and the sacred ordinances of thy house. And we beseech thee, O Lord, to preserve and extend thy kingdom of grace and to grant unto thy people, thy church throughout the world, purity of doctrine and faithful pastors who shall preach thy word with power and help all who hear rightly to understand and truly to believe it. Send forth laborers into thy harvest and open the door of faith unto all the heathen and unto the people of Israel. In mercy, remember the enemies of thy church and grant unto them repentance unto life. Be thou the protector and defender of thy people in all time of tribulation and danger. And may we, in communion with thy church and in brotherly unity with all our fellow Christians, fight the good fight of faith and in the end receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow thy grace upon all the nations of the earth. Especially do we entreat thee to bless our land and all its inhabitants and all who are in authority. Cause thy glory to dwell among us and let mercy and truth, righteousness and peace everywhere prevail. To this end, we commend to thy care all our schools and pray thee to make them nurseries of useful knowledge and Christian virtues, that they may bring forth the wholesome fruits of life. Graciously defend us from all calamities by fire and water, war and pestilence, scarcity and famine. Protect and prosper everyone in his appropriate calling and cause all useful arts to flourish among us. 
Be thou the God and father of the widow and the fatherless children, the helper of the sick and the needy, and the comforter of the forsaken and distressed. Accept, we beseech thee, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers together with the offerings we bring before thee, which is our reasonable service. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless us to repent of our sins, that we might first know them and then sincerely turn away from them, seeking your forgiveness and your mercy at our attempts to live in a manner that is pleasing to you. We pray then also for the people of our nation, that you would bless them with repentance unto eternal life as well. Grant that our country might be a moral country, a light shining in the dark world, that we might truly seek what is right, true, and merciful throughout the world. And as we ourselves are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come doing the work thou hast given us to do while it is day, before the night cometh when no man can work. And when our last hour shall come, support us by thy power and receive us into thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, thy son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. <clears throat> The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, who with thine only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit art one God, one Lord, and in the confession of the only true God, we worship the Trinity in person and the unity in substance of majesty co-equal. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Our Lord 
Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
please arise. Thank you. 